Today is May 3rd, 2014, and this is episode 106. This program is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is a new field of study. Consult your local futurist, lawyer, and investment advisor before making any decisions whatsoever for yourself. <laughs> okay, hi and welcome to another special episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. We are here the day after the end of the Toronto conference, and today, as always, I'm joined by the other hosts of Let's Talk Bitcoin, Andreas Antonopoulos and Stephanie Murphy. Hello. Hey there. It's the after-school special of Let's Talk Bitcoin, <laughs> the after-conference special. Yes. Uh, we also have a special guest this time. Very, very happy to say that uh, Mr. Amir Taki is joining us for this Mister. recording. Mr. Mr. Pleased to meet your acquaintance. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing today, Amir? Uh, yeah, wow. What an intense weekend. <laughs> seriously, seriously. So what about it for you was particularly intense? Uh, just the, the real sense of, of community and all the people so very nice and, and, and warm and that there's real heart. In, in everything that everybody's doing, you know, it's very different from all the other conferences. This is the one conference I've chosen to come to in the last like year or two years. Well, we're, we're very, very happy to have come. Yeah, I was going to say, we're very glad you did. I think you picked a good one. Yeah, I just earlier this week, I was just in New York City for the Inside Bitcoins conference. Totally different vibe, totally different flavor. It was, you know, a lot of investors, a lot of VCs and people with projects trying to raise money, a lot of talk about how to comply with regulations. Actually, that was like all that people talked about at the New York one. Well, it's a media beast. Well, you know what Bitcoin's about, freedom. <laughs> right, you wouldn't have known from that conference. <laughs> but yeah. this, Toronto was way more community focused, um, so I enjoyed I enjoyed that nice. It's like the yin and the yang, you know. And a huge turnout as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I was really impressed by. They must have a big community here in Toronto to begin with because they've got Bitcoin Decentral and there's a lot of people working on Ethereum here and other various projects. And it just seems like this the whole community kind of volunteered to like do this conference and, you know, they're going to invest whatever they take away from it back into the conference. It's really a community building thing. It's really interesting also noting that Ethereum was, you know, this is a Bitcoin conference and put on by the Bitcoin Foundation, or the Bitcoin, so, sorry, not the Bitcoin Foundation. Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. Alliance of Canada. Thank you for correcting my second mistake on that. They're the anti-foundation. Well, I don't know if they're the anti-foundation, but they're a different organization, certainly. But Ethereum was the single largest sponsor of it. They were the platinum sponsor. And so it was interesting. Like I saw, you know, at the end, they had like five or six big boxes of T-shirts. They were just like basically giving out giant handfuls to people. I saw, I see you have a pile of Ethereum T-shirts in the corner here too. So, <laughs> I have a pile. I guess exactly. I had massive fun playing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that looks like it's an exciting project. But what do we think about, what do we think about, you know, having such a heavy presence for a project like that at a, quote, Bitcoin conference? Is this good, bad, trend, you know? Not new friends. I thought I thought it was great. I mean, you know, this all feeds into the same concept. Well, this is the year where we're beginning to see Bitcoin being treated as a platform, not a currency, or a platform as well as a currency. And uh, Ethereum takes that concept and pushes it further. Um, I've never seen Ethereum as competing against Bitcoin, and I'm working with a proof of concept code. And the very first contract I want to write in Ethereum is one that allows you to pay for Ethereum contracts with Bitcoin. It's the obvious combination. And so, well, yeah, it was great. It was great to have this community. And it also brings us a different perspective, uh, a perspective that's less about how do we make money and how do we do shopping and more about how do we use this as a platform to build yeah. hundreds and hundreds of applications that can do different things. Just one example. people who want to make money off of Ethereum. <laughs> oh, it, w without a doubt. But the people who were talking about the Ethereum code and Ethereum platform were doing some really interesting projects at the hackathon at Bitcoin Decentral for example, one of the projects they had was using an electronic door lock um, that could be unlocked based on ownership of an Ethereum contract. And the obvious application for that is to do an Airbnb rental where once you've paid for the contract for your stay, it automatically gives you the credentials to unlock the door so you can go into this Airbnb. And you can imagine doing that with cars, such as Zipcar style services based on the blockchain or Lyft or things like that. Hang on, wait a second. You're, you're telling me that I don't, that the 
that in the future when I'm doing Airbnb, I'm not going to have to get a special key at the at the lobby and then go up to floor 10M and then go to a locker room and then go go through two doors in order to get in and then do a, a padlock and unlock the <laughs> thing in order to get my key in order to go to my room. I'm not going to have to do that. I'll just be able to use my phone. Yes, yes, pretty much. It's uh... <laughs> you're ruining my day, Andreas. Well, I I love all of them. No, I think it's great. Yeah, it's great, great but it's it's like there. this was like a hackerspace project. They just went and 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 bought one of these demonstration uh these are like doors that are only like five inches uh tall with a lock on them it's like i can't fit through that but no it's for demonstrating the locks and they had it connected up to a raspberry pi and they were writing ethereum contracts to control doors and it's a five inch door you could use that for a safe or for like uh, you know something that keeps a different key in it or something or for very small people (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's like that that scene in zoolander where he goes this thing can't even fit a school for ants (laughs) tell me about some of the other uses of ethereum that you're you're talking about about before like you mentioned some interesting ideas well i think what people misunderstand is the possibility of using ethereum to do projects without having to create a full community of interest that's going to mine your blockchain just to support your project let's say you have a niche project uh, for example and, and to use the theme of social justice and, and things like that which are not immediately obvious in the ethereum space let's say you want to do something like the swiss guaranteed basic income project where you want to create a coin where every round of confirmations uh, donates money to the people who are poorest in the network, essentially guaranteeing them a basic income. And that's how the coin is issued. Now, if you build that as your own blockchain, you have to find a lot of people to agree with those politics, to agree with that idea, to mine your coin so that it's secure and it can't be taken over with a 51% attack. If you build it on Ethereum, all you have to know is that there's enough people building other useful things on Ethereum to mine Ethereum. So you get all of that security for free without having having to persuade people to buy into your projects. You know, that's an interesting argument that you're making because I, so is that not possible using other meta coins? Because I, there are lots of things that Ethereum can do that simply cannot be done with other, with some of these other meta layers that are out there. But what you just described there, I think you yeah, actually can do. Yeah, why not use do. Bitcoin yeah, for Why it. not use a protocol built on top of Bitcoin to do that? Well, because, because you're talking about using the reward of the issuance to do something specific, but without having that attached to the mining function. Okay, so, but this is what I'm saying is that with protocols like both MasterCoin and Counterparty, that's that's all they do. So, so anyways, I, I, I agree that uh, this is possible. I'm just saying that it doesn't seem like that's a that's a particular advantage of Ethereum. Ethereum, the particular advantage of Ethereum is that you can do anything. You can do all oh, these yes, incredibly arbitrarily complex things. Right, right. Whereas with the meta coins and stuff like that, you really can't. They're more about just creating a value token, and then however well, you distribute it is whatever. I'm, I'm a bit skeptic is. about uh, arbit- arbitrarily complex things because uh, if, if we imagine the concept of having like a robot which is operating an organization, and that robot maybe like when you choose to join that organization, you can to the code which operates it and you know like maybe you want to change something you can say okay uh, modify this code and, and and so it's all open source and especially with provable computation you, you get even more of that but with Ethereum it's like there's a blockchain and everybody is running those computations so for me it seems like there's there's a, there's it's putting a, a limit or a roof on on the complexity of the of the software that can operate your organizations. I said you, I know you said about Moore's law, but even with Bitcoin now it's like when you when when I work a lot with the blockchain and I that's my area of speciality in Bitcoin development. And that there is a lot of like very different uh, things that you have to consider in terms of properties or, or these massive databases. Yeah. It becomes very tricky to manage at, at some point. But I think that would be a good problem to have. If we get to the point where the demand for code complexity and contracts has increased so much that we have to solve optimization Uh problems, then that in essence proves the need for a Turing complete scripting language and the fact that there is demand for highly complex transactional code. And then then we we do have to solve the optimization problem. And that's a great problem to solve because you've just opened a whole new area of blockchain based technology. Right now, we don't even know if there's a demand for it. So, right. well, I guess my my the only thing I'm, I'm wondering about is why they chose to go with this model where they have a deep interlinkage between all the contracts, rather than you know like you you only run the computations for the set of contracts and transactions that you are interested in, rather yeah. than running all of everything 
on the whole network. That, that, from, that, that for me would maybe make more sense. That's a great that's a great question. And I think what we're going to see as soon as Ethereum is launched and proves that it can operate is we're going to see alt contracts. Uh, essentially uh-huh. alternative clones of Ethereum. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Why not? I would very much like to see alternative implementations. Just like when Bitcoin proved that this was something that could work and it was interesting and people could do useful things with it, it launched hundreds of altcoins. If Ethereum works, it's going to launch hundreds of alt contract platforms. Yeah, it's really interesting. I also like all the different projects people are doing, exploring the space, you know, and we're all friends together and open source projects. We can share the code. We can share techniques and, you know, it's all very positive. Yeah, I mean, this is the, this is the normal, um, I think, curve of a technology as it matures. You start out with an experimentation phase where the, the code fragments massively into all kinds of variations. And you get into this very fragmented phase, a fragmentation phase. Then you start going into uh, a standardization phase. Uh, where things start getting normalized again, you develop some common standards so you don't have to replicate everything and reinvent the wheel with every different version. And then finally, you get to an optimization phase where you start le- trying to solve issues of scale um, and issues of performance. But you can't really get directly to the optimization phase until you've gone through the previous two phases. You have to do the experimentation and you have to start standardizing, but you won't know what you're going to standardize until you've seen all the variations of the people want to do with yeah, it. This so. is also my concern with Bitcoin as well. Like the, Right now, there is this very strong tendency for developers to overload Bitcoin with a ton of features, like every yes. programmer's pet project. And for me, the, the thing with Bitcoin is that I, I believe that it should be kept very pure and very focused as a, as a currency. A simple protocol yeah, stack and exactly. then move the rest of the development up into the layers. I don't think that's going to be a problem, really, Amir. I think the way the consensus mechanism is distributed between developers, miners, web wallet companies, merchant companies, payment processors, all of them have to agree under the process of consensus. Otherwise, you can't do a hard fork. Well, it already happened with the, the bit. 16 addresses yes but in the beginning it was like with the proposal was op eval yes uh but then it was discovered that there was like actually some exploits in this and then it was like okay we just make this hack to the scripting language and then the then there was like a loss of properties of static analysis so then the developers were like oh let's make it so it's push only and a lot of that was actually rushed through very quickly right and that and then we had the the multi-sig addresses and multi-sig hasn't even been used we still don't have it in any of the Bitcoin clients. And, and, and my concern is like, maybe we should step up, take a step back. And really, if we want to make these kind of fundamental changes to Bitcoin, really, really think them through. So like, you actually think that Bitcoin development is going too fast? In terms of changing the standard of the protocol, yeah, there's a very strong uh, pull to do that. You know? Yeah, well, I, it, think, I think it's going to slow down. I think because consensus is now diffuse yeah, yeah, among yeah. so many different parties, it's going to get harder and harder and harder to pull through a hard fork type change because you won't be able to get enough people to agree to it until probably two to three years from now, the core protocol grinds to a halt. It becomes completely static because just like IPv4, came to a halt because at some point it gets embedded in so much hardware and so much specialized software and so many embedded devices that you can't change all of them to do a completely new version of the code. So then whatever we've done by that time, that's it. That's going to be Bitcoin but forever. The, the converse of that is looking at like web standards, which every year they add more and more stuff in there. And, and in the end, it's something so complex that is like massively long with different pages. Yeah. That only large corporations can actually implement that. And that actually stops the diversity of the ecosystem. But you had, they had to do that in the layers above IP because IP became essentially ossified. It got built into silicon so many times that you couldn't really change it. I think Bitcoin's being built into silicon. Here's one example right. for uh, the uh, BIP32 standard for hierarchical deterministic wallets and how you do the path discovery and uh, seeding and key generation for those paths. Uh, that standard is now being driven primarily by the implementation of it in the Trezor hardware wallet, because yeah. once that hit hardware, they couldn't make any more changes. So now everything has to be considered, well, can we do this or will it break backwards compatibility with Trezor? And this is going to happen increasingly as things hit hardware. Uh, 
essentially Bitcoin is, is going to turn into a firmware, hardware implemented protocol in many devices, and then you can change it. Then whatever we have, we're stuck with. Well, you can change it. But just with enormous cost and enormous difficulty. <laughs> right, exactly. You just essentially invalidate everyone who came before. Yes, and IPv6 has been trying to do that for 16 years and failing. Yeah, it's, it it hasn't gone very far. It hasn't gone very far. <laughs> It, despite enormous needs to do yes. it because addresses wow, have run tragic. out. Is that a centralized organization or a decentralized organization? It's a completely decentralized organization and IPv6 can't replace IPv4 because the IPv4 protocol is, is abandoned in so many places mm -hmm. and you can't obsolete all of them. So, I mean, that is a classic example of what happens with a protocol. It's not, it's, it can't even support its own upgrade anymore. Okay, so if Bitcoin is vulnerable to that, then Ethereum might be even more vulnerable to that because like people are already talking talking a lot about a lot of applications for it that really do interface with hardware, like the locks that you were talking about. Yeah, but the, the, the point is, I think Ethereum is less vulnerable to that because Ethereum, instead of like Bitcoin, where if you want to implement new things, you have to do protocol changes. Ethereum flips that on its head and says, here are a basic set of primitives. These will not change. The code you execute on top of these primitives can be as varied as you want. So now when you want to do a new application, you don't need new features in the protocol stack. Mm. You just reuse the existing primitives. That means you can standardize the underlying protocol stack much sooner. So for people who don't understand what primitives are, we're talking about uh, these are essentially like building blocks. The building blocks, yeah. So, but that's, so the, that's the thing that they can't change then, right? Like they, they have can't to change they, the building blocks. They but have the, to get the, that right from the, the beginning. The building blocks have to be right from the beginning, but they are much more basic, whereas with with Bitcoin, what we're doing is with every new application, we're adding new building blocks. So multisig, for example, involved changing the fundamental building blocks of the protocol to implement in a very ugly hack. With Ethereum, you wouldn't need to do that at all. You would just use the, 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 the signature primitive uh, and the uh, key primitives, and then you'd implement the actual multisig as a contract, which could be in an abstract language. So, Amir, how does this relate to the work that you've done with LeBitcoin? Uh, you mean Ethereum? But not not Ethereum. Mm. No, no. I mean this uh, this you know hack together ah, uh, everything in one approach. Well, I, I think it's it's very important uh, to have a, a diverse ecosystem. Can you just uh, summarize the Bitcoin real quick? Yeah, it's a, it's a Bitcoin implementation. The like you know there's different implementations of the standard as set down by Satoshi when he first wrote Bitcoin. So this um, is, is for, for our listeners, this would be like the the implementation of the uh, World Wide Web standards in Firefox versus Chrome, right? And we have one standard, which is the Bitcoin core implementation, the Satoshi reference client, let's let's say that's Chrome, and then you're, you've built a different one, which is, say, Firefox. Yeah, and um, it, it's very important in software to have a diverse ecosystem. If you look at Linux, which runs a lot of our, uh, our infrastructure, our technological infrastructure, it's very secure because it's so diverse. There is no really one attack that you can use against all the Linuxes. Like in, in nature, if you, if you start to have, if the population drops below a certain size, there isn't enough genetic variation that one pathogen can go and quickly wipe out the entire population. Yeah. And we have to build our software especially if we're thinking about big distributed systems with the same principles in mind. and uh, Not like bananas. Like bananas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, that's not just a, <laughs> a funny comment. Bananas are all cloned from the exact same I, plant. The, yellow ones. Oh, yeah. the, the banana that we know, the Chiquita banana, is a relatively new invention, right. uh, and yeah. it's all cloned. And the reason it was cloned is because the previous type of banana uh, was completely wiped out worldwide by a single pathogen, and not a single example of it exists. And they're trying to recreate the previous type of banana because apparently it was tastier. <laughs> Um, okay. But all of the bananas in the world are essentially clones of the same organism, and they're very susceptible to a single pathogen wiping them all out, which is exactly your argument uh, yeah, about the Bitcoin implementation. Recently, no? Yes, there's actually a pathogen right now that is wreaking havoc across banana yeah, plantations. Yeah, starvation problems and so on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the banana is a perfect example of a strict monoculture that is very susceptible because it has no genetic variation. But even in things like um, over-engineered crops like wheat or corn, 
corn, that's a problem. Whereas uh, other things like rice that have a lot more variety in regional areas are less susceptible to to single pathogens. You're right. We need to do that in Bitcoin too. And I'm, Bitcoin is, is awesome because it gives us another perspective. Bitcoin J uh, by Mike Hearn is another example of a completely independent implementation of Bitcoin. And I believe there's uh, BTCD, which is yeah. an implementation in the Go, Go language. Yes, as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but also it's, it's important as well that if you want to build a real community around Bitcoin software, that we actually build the software such that it allows developers to participate. The mm -hmm. problem with the Bitcoin D software is it's very poorly engineered. It's a massive blob. It's a hairball. Yeah, and, uh, and, a, and a lot of the code as well, like in many places, is, is even, even doing really dodgy things like the, the C script inheriting from STD Vector, which has a non-virtual destructor, could potentially cause a, a memory leak in, you know, or, or even in the, in, in the serialization code, there's many times where it's just like copy-paste, but if the arguments changed or one more argument added instead of like using templates and, and also the dodginess with all the locks and there's many different things, like sometimes just looking and you just see them all around. And, and that's the massively improved version of the code after five years. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing we do know about Satoshi Nakamoto is he wasn't a very good programmer. I know he was a, a genius, genius he, No, he's a genius cryptographer, yeah, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. and a genius in terms of digital currencies and the economic implications and how you build a monetary system on digital currencies. Genius. But if you look at his code, anyone who really is a good coder looks at it and thinks, oh my God, yes, what a right. mess. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the, the guy as well, when I I read uh, his paper I get a strong sense he's, he's a physicist not a mathematician yeah not computers but a physicist like That's... he really writes in that kind of sense Right. And an academic. Yeah. yeah, so she's definitely not a really good C++ programmer. You always say she. <laughs> I don't know why. You always say he. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wicked. <laughs> CryptoKit is the world's first Chrome browser Bitcoin wallet. It's the easiest, fastest Bitcoin wallet payment system. With a simple one-click install, it takes just seconds to get your wallet set up. And because CryptoKit finds the address and payment for you, there's no more fussing around or tab switching. CryptoKit is more than just a wallet. It comes with a preloaded PGP encrypted social network, news feeds from Reddit and Google, and up-to-date charts from exchanges. Finally, CryptoKit directory allows you to make two-click payments with any of the BitPay merchants. Once you install CryptoKit, you won't need anything else. For more information or to download CryptoKit, visit CryptoKit.com. Let's Talk Bitcoin is heard each week by thousands of people who are participating in the new digital economy. Our listener base of Bitcoin owners, miners, investors, technologists, and merchants is growing fast. We offer a limited number of short advertising slots in each show to keep our listeners engaged and to provide maximum impact for our sponsors. If you'd like to talk to us about Let's Talk Bitcoin, send us an email at sponsors at letstalkbitcoin.com. With the software, it's important that if you want to have people to be able to participate, that you need to break it down into small bricks, which is the Unix principle. Build a brick that does one thing and one thing well, yes. and then slot them together. And I also aim for simplicity of implementation, which is which is part of the, you know, worse is better school of thought in, in development, especially for system software, which has a different set of uh, constraints to application software. With system software, you're really worried about, you know, how the thing operates unseen, you know, like with the, with the threading model, how, the, how it all works internally on, on the on the kernel level. Well, it's never used on its own. It's always used as a built-in right. component in something else. So you have to account for what this something else will do exactly. with its behavior, and you have to give it a very robust foundation. Exactly. And one of the things that 
about Bitcoin Core, which is natural for reference clients, it always happens across all of the standards, is that it tries to do everything in one place. So, and, and they've been trying to pull apart into different modules. Recently, for example, the CLI was extracted completely from the rest of it. The JSON RPC client was extracted completely from Bitcoin Core. And now uh, the wallet is being extracted from Bitcoin Core. Uh, because when you try to do too many things in a complex system, then you have unwanted interactions essentially side effects that occur exactly. when one thing gets called and it has a side effect somewhere else. Let me give you an example. If you want to use Bitcoin Core, the node software as a peer-to-peer -peer node to watch an address, you can't watch an address unless that address exists in your wallet. So now the dependency of the network node depends on the code in the wallet software. And LibBitcoin is fundamentally different than that. Each module does only one thing very simply, very directly with no side effects, right? But I don't want to talk too much about LibBitcoin and dominate the thing. But but, but yeah, I, I think it's very important in terms of, of development that we, we start to think how can we get more people involved so mm -hmm. that there's more oversight by community and developers because people need to understand the actual decisions that are going down underneath. Mm -hmm. And if you have a big monolithic blob, it's very difficult for people to become and get involved in that. So right. if you split up into pieces, people can take that piece, make it their own, work on that without, without needing to understand about all this complexity that's going on around. Right. You can't just change one thing and have it affect something else you didn't expect to. Yeah. And uh, the, the reason why I, I, st I started to rewrite a library is a technical decision, because in the beginning, we... We took the Satoshi code and we started to optimize it. We started to make changes, put Python bindings. But, the, but in the end, I really thought that Bitcoin as a piece of software that's fundamental with, a, with like long term, we need a, a solid foundation. And I start to write that code, you know, and, and uh, what was this? Uh, in, in April 2011. And the thing is, it's like to have the, the we need the the, the people who are using Bitcoin to actually have the voice behind Bitcoin. It's not enough that we have like one core group of professional developers who say, you know, we are going to make the decisions on behalf of the community, which, which by the way, with, uh, with, uh, with BIP16, when that was happening, I was, I was writing articles about it and getting a lot of criticism from developers because I was actively encouraging the community to decide whether to switch to that version and, and, and support by mining that new version of the Bitcoin software or keep continuing to use the old one. And the developers were saying to me that, that this is a development decision. This is an engineering decision, not a decision by the users. Well, to a certain extent, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, because, uh, I mean, you're both, you and Andreas are very technical, and I am technical, not very much, and um, Stephanie no, is technical, not very I'm much. Lost. And so, I, we've both been exchanging looks, because I think you lost us about 10 minutes ago. What the so, are they talking so, I mean, about? So, so this, is, this is the problem, I think, is that how do you have an informed community make a good decision when there is no informed community because these issues are very technical. Question. I feel like we're, you know, I feel like Stephanie and I are in the land of cars and you and Andreas are talking about the land of sewers that exists several layers underneath that. I don't know anything about those, you know, so I mean, so, so how do we, how do we make informed decisions? It's about participation, you know? Yeah. There's the open source onion skin model, which, uh, which you, usually we can represent, like you've got your outside layers where maybe some guys come to the website, they check it out and then they leave. But then maybe ten percent of those actually download the software and run it, and and then you know, and then they drop to the next level of that onion, and then maybe ten percent of those actually become your hardcore users, and they start to do testing, and they start to submit bug reports, and a few of those who actually become like maintainers doing packaging and actually participating. So it's about being inclusive. It's about being inclusive. It's yeah. also about the uh, the adoption curve, which is that if you make it easy for people to adopt Bitcoin as users, you want to make sure. That that a certain percentage, you know, a tenth of a percent of those people uh, 
actually download and compile the code. And they'll do that if it's easy to compile the code. And the experts among them will then go a bit further and do a bug report. If it's easy to do a bug report, if you can read the code, if it's modular. So what um, Amir is talking about and what he's doing with the Bitcoin is really fundamental because if you make the, the system more approachable, that means a larger percent of all of the people we're bringing into this ecosystem in this community will end up writing a bit of code. And that means that in the future, we won't have a core developer group of just 12 or so people. We'll have a core developer group of 200 people like we have in Linux, for example. Um, and there you have a, a couple hundred core developers, but then you also have thousands of other developers who are doing very deep testing on individual components of the code. You know, just like Jeff Garzik, for example, who's one of the core developers in Bitcoin, spent his entire career before this dedicated to one part of the Linux kernel in the network stack. And he worked just that one part. And he was part of a, a community of thousands of developers. Um, Jeff Garzik is actually a very good Linux kernel developer. Yeah. He's one of the best. Absolutely. And and he's brought that experience to, and he's one of the people really pushing to include more and more people in the development community. Um, but the the problem is when you start with a hairball, it's hard. Mm. Uh, and, you know, despite the dedication, the, the 12 people who are in this, they're overworked. They are overwhelmed. They have to not only deal with feature requests, but also all of the bugs and all of the optimizations that need to be do, done and, and make some very difficult decisions, decisions that seem like engineering decisions in one context. If you look at them from a different perspective, they influence what applications you can build. So they're roadmap decisions. And if you look at them from a third perspective, they influence some of the economic implications and social implications of what Bitcoin can do. So then they're actually political decisions. So you have to make decisions that are engineering, architectural, roadmap and political decisions. And no one should have to have that burden uh, of making that decision across an entire ecosystem. And, and also, if you want to actually uh, focus on the work that matters uh, and, and really uh, develop a like, good piece of technology, it's a creative endeavor, mm -hmm. something that you really, you can't be like dealing with the day-to-day -day grind of bug reports and small fixes and so on. It's something you really need to sit down, you know, chill out, clear your mind and, and think like, and and, and really, really like get into that headspace where, where you know you you're able to discover, and it's it's kind of difficult to describe, but it's it's the same as if you're a writer or an artist, you know. Yeah. There's there's a difference between like, you know, programming nine to five, you know, just fixing bugs or or doing little small feature requests without any like long term perspective about where your code wants to go, versus you know, actually thinking on a deeper level about the real ramifications or, and, and also a lot of this comes from experience as well. It's, it's very easy for, uh, certainly for me to have an opinion. And I just want to make it clear that I, I know very well, my opinion is worth absolutely nothing here. The only thing that matters in terms of Bitcoin implementation is the code submitted, right? And opinions are great, but unless you ter take that opinion and write some actual software and do a pull request, I don't want people to think or even say, as I've heard many people say, uh, go to the core developers and say, hey, Andrea said so-and-so, why aren't you doing it? And <laughs> And, and they give them the correct answer. We are we accept pull requests. Like if you think what I'm DIY, saying you know? is a good idea, write some code. And if you don't can't write it to Bitcoin Core, write it to LibBitcoin, uh, write it to Bitcoin J, write it to BTCD. Um, but you know, my opinion is worth nothing without code. Yeah, that's also the thing as well. We can't just be always talking about like what would be better. Yeah. The only way that we we can change the situation is by actually putting out good software that people want to use. And the way that we're gonna do that is by is by playing on our strengths, you know, like what what are the properties or principles of our software that people would want to use it. You know, like for instance, stuff with the internet, it's it's an open open platform. You know, that's why it's better than than T V, you know, like you consume your own culture among your peers or or software like BitTorrent or or, or Linux, you know, they, there's, there's always trade-offs, you know, between different types of software. So you're saying, like, you know, you opinions mean nothing. You have to put in requests for code if you want anything to actually change. And that or makes write sense. Your own code. Or write your own, or write yeah. your own. But, like, I'm not going to do that. How can I don't even know how to go about, like, 
suggesting some different code for Bitcoin or like what to suggest. I'm but way it, more likely to like switch to an altcoin or something if I you know, see some feature that I like more. Well, that's an important contribution too. You're sending signaling, you're signaling essentially decisions and market decisions with your choices of what things you, uh, what things attract you politically mm-hmm. or in terms of your opinion. And so if people start switching to an altcoin, that sends a very strong message. I'm not saying people should switch to an altcoin. I'm just saying that the choices people make and which wallet they use, even which version of Bitcoin client they download, that in itself is a consensus action. That is you deciding, I want to be on the latest fork with the latest code, which means I like the changes that the development team added. And if you don't make that upgrade, you're saying, I would like to stay where we were before. That's how the consensus mechanism is spread between users, wallets, web wallets, merchants, uh, developers, and miners. Especially as we get more people on board, though, they're not going to know that. It's a matter of percentages. So what you do is you assume... Right, and the the new user percentage, like once we get mass adoption, then the percentage of new users who have no clue about this stuff is going to be massive and overwhelm the people who actually are informed about what's going on. But that's okay, because you're also going to bring in a lot of new developers. Um, And we're already seeing that. I mean, the number of developers in this space is exploding. Um, People who are interested but not now. as much as the number of people who have no clue. That's, that, what, that's it's, true. It's like voting. It's like yeah. most people have no clue. They see a name at the top of the list and like, oh, that sounds like a stately name. I'm going to vote for that person. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like you get this. Uh, it sounds like democracy and it sounds like it's fair, but most people really have no clue what they're doing. Well, even for people who do have you know coding experience, I mean, you're, you're not a core dev, right? Um, what does it take to become a core dev? A core dev is someone who writes code for the Bitcoin core. It's not like Gavin Andreessen pulls out the sword and puts it on your shoulder and says, I hereby anoint you core dev. You can call yourself a core developer if you, the code you wrote has had an influence on Bitcoin core. That's all it means. Someone who develops for the core client. It's not a title. I yeah, see, most people don't decides, know that either. Yeah, I mean, this is what I'm, I guess I'm asking: is who decides oh, you write, what's included you, in the code? What's included in the core? It's a consensus mechanism. You write a useful patch, you submit it on GitHub, and if the developers like the patch and is tested and works out and so solves a, a new problem, developer coming in trying to solve a problem that the development that the existing development team might not know has to have the idea vetted by the rest of the development team before it can be included. All, no, all the developers have to have the ideas vetted by the rest of the development team. Uh, if if Gavin Andreessen wants to make a change to the code, he does a pull request so just like everybody else. Yeah, it's a it popularity is, contest. It's, it's not, not entirely. No, contest. it's not a popularity it contest. Is, it, it is in some ways, but at the same time, you are submitting code. And if your code works and it solves a real problem that people are trying to solve or it fixes a bug, it will be included. And you are then a core developer. Uh, the ones who do this repeatedly uh, build credibility among the community and they get their code accepted more often. Uh, and keep in mind, the core developer group is not a monolithic group at all. There's a lot of diversity in it. There's a lot of disagreement in that group. If you follow the debates and discussions, sometimes it gets pretty damn heated, even among the core developers. So you can find a very broad range of opinions in there as to how things should be done. Um, and these opinions eventually get translated into code. And sometimes there's competing code for the but same there thing. There is a lot of power there, you know. Oh, for sure. Like Gavin Andreessen took me off the security mailing list as a political slight against me mm. and they were all like ganging up on me at one point and, you know like pushing and that's why like really I didn't like go and cooperate with that group I was like okay I go and do my own thing because I, I've been involved in a lot of open source projects and yeah I can see a lot of repeating patterns yeah often early on you know so I'm always a bit apprehensive to invest like tons of my energy and time where I think that I'm going to be held back a lot Right. Nice. Well, so I mean, it that's a matter how good your that. code was. Exactly. It's part of the political process, you know, having that, that, you know, that energy to go and actually do. And, you know, and also like as a coder who wants to maintain my independence because I want to represent a certain voice within the community. Yeah. It's important that I'm unconstrained, you know, that I, I have right. the freedom. And see, like, I would probably agree with your a lot of your political views, but like, I didn't know that you were kicked off of the mailing list, you know, like. Yeah. 
And but more importantly, so you have I'm an alternative implementation. Because I don't know how to code, and so... Well, what? Uh, so let's talk about alternative implementations. In practice, what does this mean? I mean, how do I... Use- it means that if you tell the wrong person to go fork themselves on an open source project, sometimes they build something that's better than the original fork. Okay, so, so but let's talk about that in practice. The Bitcoin has been underway since, you said, uh, early 2000, 2011? Okay, so what is it being used for at this point? Where, What type of application can I find where it's actually using that as opposed to the more mainstream implementation that uh, is not modular? Th- there was, do you know this company, Airbits? Yeah, I saw it at this event today. Yeah, they're, they're using Bitcoin for their wallet. And oh, wow. There's a guy as well, he's developing a hardware project. It's a very, it's, it has a set of different, uh, it's got so are these are all, these 2 million. Are these all new projects? Uh, yeah, Airbits is a relative new project. Airbits is something they're trying to like really make Bitcoin mainstream and ease of use. Like they're doing apps that will like automatically fill in restaurants near you that accept Bitcoin and mm-hmm. things like that. And, and it's very nicely designed software as well. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also a guy who's developing a range of hardware projects. He has like a two million investment, and he's using Lib Bitcoin for that as well. And also in dark quality, we're using Lib Bitcoin. So. We have a, so it's getting there. Yeah. So that right now there isn't anything right now, but there's stuff in the works that's going to use it. And actually, uh, a lot of the decisions uh, that I've arrived at actually came from my experience when I was developing Electrum. The reason I originally became an Electrum developer was to switch Electrum to a Lib Bitcoin backend, mm. because there's all these different wallet projects now, like Hive Wallet, Electrum. You know, uh, Lib Bitcoin, and we have different focuses on the full part of the stack. Like Hive is really thinking a lot about the interface, how to get that experience with the market, and thinking about how the people interact at the front level. Mm -hmm. Electrum is really thinking about on the desktop wallet part about the features underneath, like the two factor, about making it modular so people can plug in different interfaces port to different platforms like mobile phone and so on. Whereas Bitcoin is thinking more about the blockchain part, the server part. Like that's, a, that's also a difference with the other Bitcoin implementations, except maybe BTCD, uh, which also is a very interesting project because I see a lot of the concepts they develop also in parallel, you know, so they're also thinking about things nicely too. And, uh, we want to optimize Bitcoin for the server because that's where I fundamentally believe the blockchain is heading is, is to the server and it's it's something we can continue to deny and see, see how can we optimize it further for the desktop and so on but we have to face the reality which is that not all people are going to run the blockchain on their server and even if it takes 10 minutes to validate that's 10 minutes too long mm. yeah well there's other implementations also that have uh, broad commercial use for example i know a lot of companies that are using server-based implementations so they have large multi-node resilient connections into the blockchain network are using Bitcoin J instead of Bitcoin Core. Uh, Bitcoin J is a project developed by Mike Hearn, who uh, used to be at Google, but I think he's now working full-time on Bitcoin J as as that project and as a core developer. But my problem with Bitcoin J as well is uh, uh, the, the Mike Hearn, uh, he, he works for Circle, you know, when, when he talks a lot, uh, he talks... That's Jeremy Allaire's new kind of mainstream financial... Yeah, Bitcoin yeah, and company. Jeremy Allaire takes Who said at the uh, New York Bitcoin conference that Bitcoin is going to be integrated, is going to be part of the world banking system and a yeah, bunch of... Jeremy other. Allaire said we need to leave these libertarians behind, these yes. crazy guys. We need mm-hmm. to reject them. Bitcoin needs to become mainstream and... Welcome uh, yeah. to the PayPalization of Bitcoin. Exactly. And, and Mike right. Hahn is part of that crew. Yeah. Now, well, how, I, how much part of that group? Uh, uh, I mean, because... He holds those ideals and values very much so. And and as, as software developers, we are encoding our values and ethics in the software because software is art. Without it's a doubt. It's not something that, that's functional, yeah? And... We really, really, if as as developers, like you are representing some voice, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's like, and, and and this is also a problem that is going to happen in the future, as you know, like if we put too much of our infrastructure into into centralized development groups surrounded by proprietary ecosystems, that corporations who are funding the development of this Bitcoin software will come and put pressure on on the developers, say, you know, we need to have 
features we need to protect our well, it's more it's more about the opposite which is for example and this will happen very soon um, somebody decides uh, whether they want to implement a coin join interface into the software and then the corporation that's funding this says oh no that sounds way too risky terrorism and money anarchist. laundering porn drugs <laughs> ah! <laughs> won't somebody please think of the children, children yes <laughs> please, who's going to protect protect us from the bad guys. Yeah, and so yeah. somebody is thinking of the children. They're thinking that the children should probably have some freedom when they grow up and not be slaves <laughs> to the machine. Hey everybody, Adam B. Levine here. As the launch of LTB coin approaches, there are some basic steps we ask everyone to take in preparation for our network token. Members of the audience, if you'd like to receive some coins set aside for the initial community, please get involved at forum.ltbcoin.com. People who have more than five posts before launch will receive some of the first audience coins. To use a combined Bitcoin LTB coin wallet, visit counterwallet.co, C-O-U-N-T-E-R-W-A-L-L-E-T dot C-O. If you've written an article or posted an episode for LTB in the last year, just keep it up. We've got you covered. If you plan to create content for LTB but haven't so far, now is an excellent time to jump in and be ready when the weekly distribution starts. The new Let's Talk Bitcoin.com is basically done, and we're getting ready to spin up the first 10 or so LTB blogs to feed the new front page. If you're running a show for LTB now or would like to run one of the first curated blogs, please contact Adam at Let's Talk Bitcoin.com for further instructions. Would be LTB coin speculators. Thank you for your interest. If you'd like to purchase LTB coins as soon as they're available, you can place your orders on counterwallet.co's distributed exchange, selling XCP or BTC and buying LTB coin. LTB won't be selling any of these coins. They're just our internal token system distributed to our community based on how much they contribute. But you're welcome to buy them from someone who will sell them to you. Back to the show. Those are the kinds of decisions that you don't even notice. They're, they're not really affirmative choices to do something specific. They're more choices to not pursue a specific activity because it's too controversial. So those are areas but where my, you'd see that problem. I have a problem with the fact that Mike Hearn was collaborating with the Dutch police on how to shut down Silk Road. That for me is, an, is, is, an, is like a... Well, so let's get into this. Let's talk about Silk Road for a second, because you bring up Silk Road a lot when I, I hear you talk. And it's again, amazing. I, I think that people have this idea in their head that Silk Road equals illegal stuff. And I think that when you talk about it, it's more Silk Road equals non-restricted markets, a free markets, as opposed to markets that have arbitrary limitations. What, what, what is the Internet all about? Why is the Internet so great? It's because it busted the lid off of, of, of the restrictions that empower people. Yeah, the to gatekeepers freely took them away. Yeah, mm-hmm. and why why are we why do we have this cognitive dissonance about markets that somehow if everybody had the ability to trade that we'd all start raping each other and murdering each other and selling poison? No, we'd sell food and no. In fact, and, uh, the, even no, the, the drugs poison that is were, under FDA approval and it's sold it's, by giant pharmaceuticals. Yeah, Monsanto <laughs> right. and, and we eat it every day. Yeah, I think there's a great argument to say that the Silk Road actually made um, recreational drug use a lot safer for many people because I, they're I not. I lived with drug dealers, violent drug gangsters. Yeah, they were beating people with metal bars, breaking their bones. Yeah, vicious people really shitty people yeah i'm pretty sure and, you and, can't stub someone over ip yeah huh? yeah, <laughs> yeah but the, the thing is yeah it's like how come these guys exist yeah for a plant that anybody can grow like a weed but we don't have the same problem for potato farmers mm-hmm. you know for potatoes yeah it's because it's criminalized of yeah, course exactly and this so if you can go from. on the internet and you can buy something on a unrestricted marketplace it's probably going to be way better because it's suddenly it's taken out of that realm of the black market where anything like that can happen. And you can't be stabbed over TCP IP. But the flip side of this, all this is hilarious. I get to play this guy. It's illegal. They'll put you in jail. So, I mean, that's why you have all this stuff. Yeah, but so was being gay and so was women's rights. And, you know, 
In well, some places, history. it is still. <laughs> uh, so it was coffee. For 150 years, coffee was considered a gateway drug that would lead to the destruction of morality and society that destroyed your children, well, turned them into... Earth was not the center of the universe. Turned them into shaking, crazed people who would stab people because they drank too much coffee. Uh, this is true. You could look it up. It was banned in that Holland for 150 <laughs> years. <laughs> yeah, if I have too much coffee, I, I do sometimes get a bit crazed. <laughs> Grains um, of truth. But, but, but I still haven't stabbed anyone <laughs> because of it though no. although that would make a good defense I'm sorry your honor I just had too much espresso <laughs> it's uh it's also, a- like why in, why in America as well that America's need for cocaine is 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 funding huge amounts of death in Ecuador and the highest murder rates in the world between these massive drug gangs satisfying a, a, a need of of wealthy Americans to take a, a crappy generic drug that really doesn't bring anything to your consciousness or your well-being, it's it's ludicrous. It's this war on drugs is just helping politicians to get better, more and more political capital, helping fund more and more militaries and police. Oh, and, and like the and, people who and, enforce and these laws. Empowering drug gangsters. Well, yeah, that's, the, the, that's the, the thing. The Silk Road and markets like that the most important target or the ones who are most threatened by those markets are the drug cartels. Yeah. They are threatened more than anyone else. If you have those free markets, there is no longer a need to have the drug cartels. So that's the cognitive dissonance there. Here's something that actually could be effective in stopping the drug cartels and violence all around the world rather than the drug war, which is fueling those things. That's a great point about the hypocrisy. I was just going to make another point about that, which is that the people who enforce these laws, they don't follow them. You know, D- tell me the cop that arrests the 20 year old kid for getting drunk in the U.S. never took a sip of alcohol before he was 21 or that he never smoked pot. Really? Come on. It's it's crap. I mean, <laughs> what were you saying, Adam, about like the Silk Road and how Amir talks about the Silk Road? Well, just that again, you know, we're talking about unrestricted markets versus arbitrarily restricted markets. It doesn't, I mean, again, it's that whole borders thing. If borders matter, then restrictions matter. If borders don't matter, then why do restrictions matter? Because you can be anywhere you want. So again, I mean, it's all, it's all this, the idea that morality is local is probably not a terrible one, but the idea that morality dictating laws for entire populations based on locality is probably not a great idea. And I think in yeah. practice, it's been pretty bad. You think the idea that morality is local is not a bad idea? I mean, like, well, it morality how was local. You mean it? My values are different than your values, Stephanie, and I don't think that you need to have this. We don't need to have the same values. No, so again, not, not values. Local. Not values, but like m- certain, like murder is not okay in some places in the world. Well, right? okay. And so again, we're talking about natural law versus laws of men. I agree with you. Natural. I just wanted to get clear on that because it sounded like. Sorry. Yeah. Again, <laughs> it's been a long couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. No. Again, there is definitive good and bad. And I think that there are certainly shades of gray, but there are some things that are kind of basic. You don't steal, you don't kill people. You know, you don't, it's basically initiations of force. It's basically, you know, uh, doing something that impacts someone else in a way that they don't want and without their permission. Again, if we have relationships that are essentially based on two way voluntary interactions, then there's no such thing as a bad deal because a bad deal is just a deal that doesn't happen. Right. So isn't the US meant to be the land of the free? Well, it was at one like, point, but again. But with the export restrictions and all that. No, <laughs> that that's just a story for children. Yeah. <laughs> and again, I've been, I've been thinking about this a lot. So I watched a movie on the way up here uh, to Canada. Uh, it was, uh, I actually watched two movies. One was Anchorman 2, but the better one was... Uh, was uh, uh, how can you top that? Uh, the Hunger Games sequel, Catching Fire. And uh, not a tremendously good movie either, but the thing that it sort of made me realize was that the problem isn't that people can have success or people can have victory, but once you've done that, during the interim, where you have that I am the success, you have this urge to try and leverage victory or success into entitlement. And so entitlement is just victory that lasts forever. (laughs) And, you know, you've done it once, or you might have to reestablish it periodically. But the point is, is that it's work you did way before. You're not doing it anymore, but yet you still want the reward for having done that work. And you want it to continue to go to you because you did it way back then. 
Military is exactly the same thing. You look at the history of world currencies, and there are periods of 120 to 220 years where the world reserve currency is one particular nation's currency. It's not because they're the most economically viable nation. It's because they have the biggest military. And so in the beginning, it might have been because they were the best option. But at the end, it's not because they're the best option. It's because they have the biggest military. And eventually, the, 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 the mismatch of those two things causes a collapse and a realignment. But it takes hundreds of years to get from here to there. And so, again, like with cryptocurrency, I really think what we've done, and it's all of these decentralized things, when you can't stop technology, you can't have monopolies. And that's really, again, the thing I think that, that, has, been, that has happened here is that the ability to perpetuate a monopoly is gone. And I don't it's think it comes away. back. Well, it's no, going it's really away. It, it is individual empowerment. But that's the thing is that you can't stop it. So if you can't stop something, you know, if you, if you can't enforce the monopoly, then there is no monopoly. People haven't recognized this yet. We don't realize it yet. We don't act like it yet. But in practice, this is already done. Yeah, it takes several decades for that kind of change. Maybe, to maybe it takes several decades. The reason maybe it, it takes doesn't. several decades, though, is because it's in people's minds. You right. know, like people aren't thinking in – they're not used to thinking that – Oh, we're free from monopolies? Really? It's like someone's in a cage and you unlock the door, but they don't know it's unlocked well, and they just stay in so there. See, but that's the thing, though, is that, is, that, uh, is that this would be true if we didn't live in the world that we live in today. But that cage is getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, and it's forcing people to try that door that they hadn't tried before. You know, if you're yeah. not, if you're no longer vested, the situation is polarizing. Exactly, and it, it forces it forces people. You know, again, the pie is shrinking. So since the pie is shrinking, it means more and more people aren't getting any pie. And if you don't have any pie in the current system, why not go to a system where there's more opportunity? Mm -hmm. So again, like lacking this sort of pressure coming from the real world out there, these opportunities, you know, I'm not sure if I would be here. Actually, I know I wouldn't be here. I never would have learned about money. I never would have cared about any of this stuff because I was happy doing what I was doing until I wasn't, you know? And then suddenly you're disenfranchised and you're like, what happened? You yeah. learn about it and you're like, oh, well, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. They get to steal everything and get away with it. Well, you know, again, like, and, and again, if, if there's nothing here for me, then why do I care about it? What investment do I have? It costs me and gives me nothing. Right. Are you trying to imply that you're not fully vested in your IRA and 401k to build your stable future? <laughs> I had the opportunity to add to an IRA and 401k for two years. And my grandparents forest. were very much recommended that I did and I did not. But uh, it, it, that's it, fantastic. That's why, that's why with the, the Silk Road, it's like, those are your users. So why are you acting against your own users? And as developers, you know, what, what, who are you representing, you know? Are you representing peer-to-peer -peer transfers, small businesses, the black market, or are you representing corporate interests? It, efforts to legitimize Bitcoin, you know, to, to regulate and, and put controls and limits, put Bitcoin in a framework, you know? Well, and I mean, there have to be... I think it's okay to have a broad range of opinions, and Bitcoin as a platform supports that broad range of opinions. But if you some want to create, are backed by a gun. If you want to build something at the end point that looks very much like a bank and operates like a bank, you're going to attract a certain number of people who are going to want that. You, you know, Bitcoin. But let's be thankful for having people like Amir who expand that range of opinions and give us alternatives. You have to make conscious choices when you're choosing software, but you're I'm not, choosing I'm not politics. I'm blacklists and technologies to surveil right. people. Right, that's what I was talking yeah. about. There's, Bitcoin is subject to the There's some that you can't opt out of. Right, like opting well, you in can is opt out of it, though, because if Bitcoin does develop blacklists, we can opt out of Bitcoin Not and move to another though. coin. Not necessarily. If, if 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 Bitcoin becomes, if enough of the infrastructure that, it, that the network depends upon becomes co-opted in in some ways, you know, and it's not that, that there's going to be a backdoor put into Bitcoin or so on. It's more about like the day-to-day -day decisions, A or B, you know? Yeah. And a lot of these decisions are very difficult to, to decide between, you know, there's a different trade-offs, you know, and if your, your motive is slightly corrupted, you might choose choice A, which slightly more favors corporations and the black market. And then next time, you know, another A or B and lots of lots of small steps, Bitcoin ends up becoming GovCoin or CorpCoin, very different from the Bitcoin, the the uh, the principles of mm. Satoshi, you know, yeah. as encoded 
But, in but this, here's the thing. Also. You've now opened the door to hundreds and hundreds of currencies and created a world where currency is a choice and not a monopoly. And that means that if Bitcoin becomes GovCoin, unlike leaving the dollar to enter Bitcoin, for example, which is a very, very hard move, leaving Bitcoin to go to I don't really black that coin or to something honest. else is a why, lot easier. Why don't you buy that argument? Because, um, you know... The internet is the one internet we use. We're not using alternate dark nets, you know. And but we are the, using alternate dark nets on top of the internet. There are people who want to yeah, go on top of the internet, you know. Yes. But like with Bitcoin, this is a system that is 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 here. It's got the first mover, the network effects, and it's it's going to establish itself a lot more. And and the fight really is for the consensus of that system. Mm -hmm. How do we want that consensus to move? Do we want it a consensus that favors the people, or do we want a consensus that favors, you know, uh, uh, trusted operators? Mm -hmm. I prefer a Bitcoin which is open and inclusive to everybody. Mm -hmm. And and sure, people can use alternate currencies, and people will use them, and they're they're very good, you know. But Bitcoin is the one system. The that is is going to be very dominant for a long time to come, you know. I think we're going to disrupt Bitcoin again in twenty years with something else. But I don't necessarily buy that once you open the door and people have understood that currency itself is a choice and you've got transnational currencies and now you're appealing to a population that is global. You've got the other six billion who have vested interests in make, keeping this out of the hands of the people who stole their land and stole their future in the past. Um, why would they make a choice to tie themselves to something and not be able to leave? Because it's got established infrastructure, because it's got liquidity of the market. It's but like, the infrastructure yeah. is pretty lightweight and it's easy to move in and out of. It's not infrastructure that's bricks and mortars, it's virtual infrastructure. And we can very easily build alternative infrastructures. But I can easily, people can easily switch to Google Plus or. Right. Ex exactly. Networks. I was thinking that, like, try to leave Facebook, you know, I left Facebook in 2010. It was quite easy. Well, yeah, but you're, Facebook, you're still on Facebook so because someone has a fan page for you. I mean, it's like, well, I'm not on Facebook. I post I know, nothing about know, myself and my is, I don't have any friends on Facebook. No, no, I don't have I'm, any I'm connections. Not on Facebook, but undeniably, a lot of people are and yeah, they're held sure. there by and their there's, friends. There's a lot of yes, pressure. I understand. Yeah. And, and if and you're if you, using if, Bitcoin and getting paid in Bitcoin, or your favorite sites use Bitcoin, there's going to be some friction there. I'm, friction I'm really optimistic. I mean, I used to think that we'd never get rid of Windows and Microsoft. <laughs> you know, we were locked into that worse, for you know, like, yes, yeah. but we were locked into that for 20 years. I think if you say it's worse, you don't remember very well what it was like but, to be locked into Windows an ecosystem. Windows is different, really, because it's like a is piece it? of software that you use. It's not. It's like a video editing software. I can download it. I can use it. It doesn't matter what other people are doing. Oh, before Bitcoin, Linux, it did matter very much, though. Um, and I remember that time. I remember the time when there were no other operating systems and you were either locked in to Microsoft Windows or the alternative was IBM, AIX, Unix or other forms of very, very expensive hundreds of thousands of dollars Unix. That broke open. I never thought we would leave that monopoly. Yeah. I don't think Facebook is that stable or long lasting as people think. And we also switched think. from Internet Explorer, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean. All the sites were developed for it. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And what so kind of hope, but still, yeah, I because think disruption keeps important. happening. That is the central theme. Disrupt everything. Okay, but so <laughs> the friction here, I think, is the primary issue that you guys yeah, are having. Yeah. So doesn't this seem like it's a, it's just a, it's a lack of tools to make this happen? Because again, I've been thinking about this future that we have coming, where there are going to be at, at least many, many user created assets built on top of Bitcoin, if not yeah. many, many just cryptocurrencies, broadly speaking. And it seems like it's inevitable, you know, and Ripple already has done this to a certain extent, to have something like an automatic interchange wallet where basically you say, I only ever want to accept Bitcoin. And then regardless of what anybody pays you, on the back end, your wallet is trading it for whatever you want. But on the front end, you get whatever you want. And when you pay somebody, their wallet's doing the same thing. They only want Doge or they only want this one particular user created asset. That's fine. It can be converted at market rate into that. So, I mean, so doesn't. It just seems like this law, you know, there, there's a little lock in with Bitcoin. People are in other cryptocurrencies already, so it's not like everyone feels like they, they have to just stay in Bitcoin already. But adding a tool like a tool layer like that seems like it kind of removes all of the user irritation and it just becomes about preference, right? Well, that's the third step in the maturity curve. You start with experimentation, 
We had that with Bitcoin. You move to fragmentation. We've seen that now happening with the emergence of all the altcoins. Then you have standardization. You create unifying interfaces that hide the differences that allow you to do multimodal communication. Like at first you had email, then you had email, Twitter, IM and Facebook. Then you had a single interface on your phone that allowed you to communicate over all four so you can seamlessly move among them. And then you start optimizing. That's a natural progress curve. We're at the fragmentation point. At the moment, we need lots of different opinions. And at some point, we can then move between them more fluidly by standardizing the interfaces on top of that. And a lot of that, Amir, is going to happen in the user interface. That's really where the the eyeballs and the users are going to land, the ones who don't have the technical experience. So building those capabilities like Airbits is doing or other companies are doing is going to be critical because if all of the front end user interfaces make it easy for you to fluidly move among coins, then there's no lock-in. That's where the lock-in happens. The lock-in happens in the mind of the user and the user gets used to a single user interface. My, my, my concern is um, about where, so n- not only about changes to fundamental Bitcoin, but about where uh, efforts of developers become invested. Mm-hmm. You know, like there is, like, you know, half the scientists around the world work for the military. And the same with uh, the internet. Yeah. You see, there's a lot of investment of or har- harvesting of human resources that is working on technologies that surveil people, that track people, that you know limit people's freedom. And the same thing with Bitcoin as well. That, but that if there is that, there also needs to be an investment of energy, development energy, into give, equipping people with the tools to empower them, that allow them to use Bitcoin uh, for the for the reasons that we like Bitcoin and appreciate Bitcoin, rather than you know Bitcoin as you know the latest frictionless you know payment thing or latest fashion trend. You know that um, you know for me Bitcoin is is more than just about buying a drink at a bar. You know, or or any of these things is something bigger about Bitcoin, some bigger potential deep down that it is a new tool of trade and business that enables new financial models that weren't before possible, and that we can use it to create new types of associations and organisations between the people that that weren't before possible. Like you know, when you have a community with a hundred people inside and they all trust one another. You know, the things can work, but once you start to scale beyond that to a thousand people, the trust starts to break down. So you start to need, you know, uh, reputation, collateral, insurance. And that's that's why this system we live in is, is been able to scale so much because it provides us with the legal system. And the legal system gives people contractual law that they can use where maybe there isn't so much trust or personal relation involved, but they can they can create association between each other but with the new crypto tools we can actually use these features to create these things very interesting and 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 that's that's what we're trying to also do with the dark wallet is looking at bitcoin as a new tool of trade and business and thinking okay how how can we equip people with these tools how can we bring out these features that is inside the core of bitcoin to the wider world you know and it's it's a long process because also a lot of these concepts are very abstract and you have to try and think about like, okay, the use cases involved, you know, like what are the mental models that you can tie it to? When, when calculus was first invented by Newton, if you read the stuff he's, he's done, it's like, it's, it's really difficult to understand, you know, it's very dense. But then now kids are learning calculus in high school because we have developed the models and the abstractions to, to more easily be able to deal with that field. Well, here's the thing, the, the idea that we have an existing convenient set of laws and institutions that provide a stable society in which we live, and now we're trying to find alternatives, ways to organize, that in itself is a very Western-focused uh, convenience that we have grown up to live in. But then there's six billion people who live around the world who don't even have that convenience to start with. Yeah, yeah. And the beauty is that that means they don't need to subvert it. They don't need to break the habit. They don't need to come out of their comfort zone because they don't even know what fucking comfort means. Uh, they know what survival means. You can introduce Bitcoin as a modality of organizing and trade and commerce in places where there is no modality 
modality of organizing. There is no modality of law. There is no trade and commerce amongst people. There is no international trade. There is no rule of law. And you can take them directly from that to something based on Bitcoin. If we have a developer community that has 12 uh, developers from the core developer group who are all English speaking males uh, for the most part, and then you have 10,000 developers who are all Chinese, Mandarin speaking, Russian speaking, who speak uh, the languages of Indonesia or who who speak, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, Suddenly, how important is the influence of these core developers? They get completely washed out in a huge global community of developers. Well, it depends where the mining pools are. But the need of the users is much bigger in countries like India and the Philippines and Indonesia and China, where you have literally you know, 4 billion people live in that tiny circle uh, centered around Southeast Asia. 4 billion people. How many developers there? Hundreds of thousands of developers. India has 100,000 developers graduating every single year from college, right? They get on to being interested in building new financial systems, systems that won't be in English, systems that won't care about existing structures of law. All of the things you're worried about go away. These are first world problems based on a first world convenience that we have. They don't have any of that. They can just go directly to something like Bitcoin. And do you think they're going to care about regulating this for AML KYC to get VC investors from the fucking valley? Screw that. They're going to build something around their communities and they're going to create momentum around that. And then you're going to be asking for your Bitcoin client to be translated from Mandarin to English so you can use it because you don't understand what the fuck is on the screen. There's still a lot of technology that we use is coming from the West or the developers in India actually be uh, working for companies as outsourced developers. For now, because they have to build financial systems that play with the existing uh, banking infrastructure. But But now they can write, now they can write applications of their own and they can write them directly to an open financial market of Bitcoin. And that changes the game completely. We're just at the early stages. This is going to break out in a global community. And then these problems no longer exist. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion this is a conversation that isn't quite over yet, but we're out of time, guys. Andreas, Stephanie, thank you very much for joining me. Amir, would you like to have the last word? Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I won't drag it on too much. <laughs> Thanks for listening to episode 106 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for this episode was provided by Stephanie Murphy, Andreas Antonopoulos, Amir Taki, and Adam B. Levine. This episode was edited by Adam B. Levine. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens and General Fuzz. Any questions or comments, email Adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Have a good one.